Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and welcome to class 10 in our lecture series on understanding contemporary art. Uh, now, whereas last time we had gone through, uh, we had done a quick flyby uh, through some of the main exponents of pop art like Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and so forth, this time what I'd like to do in, in this lecture and the one that follows it is to go into some detail uh, into the works of Andy Warhol, especially the early Warhol works from the early 60s, which I think is the period of his greatest genius and his greatest breakthrough, although genius is not an, a word that should be used advisedly in, in the works of contemporary art. Because some of the later works, after Valerie Solana shot him in 1968, I think um, the, the later works tend to have a diminution and a repetition of his earlier works. They're not quite as good. And I think that the other thing that needs to be understood before looking at Warhol's uh, canvases is that um, he has to be understood within the, the, the context of the post-World War II cult of the dead celebrity. And I think the celebrity in the 1950s begins to take on a kind of ontological status that is very different from what the celebrity had uh, prior to that period. Uh, we think of such celebrities as Elvis Presley, James Dean, Marilyn Monroe. These are really the first gigantic humans that begin to giganify to the level of uh, drive-in screen and billboard humans, which are now uh, gigantified. They're flattened out into two-dimensional icons and they're gigantified by descending into the new electronic media that has come about. Uh, film, of course, precedes World War II, but the electronic industry does not much precede World War II and began to flourish then. Television comes in now. Television made Elvis Presley uh, an international star in 1956 when he went on television, not only on the Ed Sullivan show, but on several different kinds of shows during that year. That made him one of the first great electronic celebrities. Uh, John F. Kennedy was really the first great televisual president and so forth. So there are new ontological conditions that electronic... Uh, technology is beginning to make possible and so we're now moving into the age of the gigantic human, the flat two-dimensional avatar. And I think with, um, to a large extent with Andy Warhol, I think we can regard him uh, as the first great icon painter of the cult of the dead celebrity and especially in his early works. But first what I want to look at are some of the early uh, works where he paints the iconotypes of capitalist consumer society, which now begin to provide our culture with the new imaginary significations that begin to replace the old iconotypes and the great transcendental signifieds that we saw had been deconstructed. And by the time we got to the work of Mark Rothko, we saw how uh, he was already painting the semiotic vacancies that at the heart of the, Westerns, uh, the Western understanding of being where those vacancies had taken precedence. And now we're beginning to, the culture is beginning to find through pop art ways of filling those vacancies with the iconotypes of mass consumer culture. This is, uh, green Coca-Cola bottles of uh, 1962 by Warhol in which he paints. Uh, now the Coca-Cola bottle was something that was invented in 1915 and it was specifically designed as something that could be recognized even by the hand in the dark. So it had a very tactile quality to it, although Warhol here flattens out the image and he's painting the two-dimensional iconotype, one of the great iconotypes of consumer society is of course Coca-Cola. After World War II, uh, the Coca-Cola signifier began to become the first great planetary signifier that consumed the planet and was more recognizable, I think, even than the image of Christ's crucifixion. I think that the Coca-Cola symbol went, and the bottle along with it, went nomadologically all over the earth in areas that were never achieved before by the earlier religious iconotypes of Christianity. And uh, Warhol is correctly intuiting now here that seriality and repetition um, is going to be one of the main archetypes of consumer society, as we see here with his famous Campbell's soup cans of 1962, in which we have simply rows of Campbell's soup cans. He's basically painting the platonic forms of capitalist, of the world interior of capital, uh, the Coke bottles, the Campbell's soup cans, and here we see him <clears throat> amongst the stacks of the Brillo boxes in 1964. Um, he's painting the repetition or arranging the boxes and putting them inside the mu museum in such a way as to emphasize repetition and seriality as the main constitutive features of the capitalist Umville. But now uh, with Gold Marilyn of 1962, um, he begins to play with uh, the tradition of the Byzantine icon. He himself was raised a Greek Orthodox uh, growing up in Pittsburgh. And here we see that he's plugged Marilyn with the gold background into the ancient Byzantine iconotype of the icon, which provides the word icon uh, that became the iconotypes of the Renaissance and so forth. And here he has uh, plugged into the semiotic vacancy that we saw represented by Rothko with his uh, Seagram mural. 
Uh, he's actually plugged Marilyn Monroe into the role that was formerly occupied by iconotypes such as the Madonna. Here's an example of a Byzantine uh, iconotype of the Madonna with the gold background behind her. Um, looking back at Marilyn, then we can see how he really is the first uh, to intuit that the cult of the dead celebrity, Marilyn had just died in August of 1962 when he painted this, is now the new inspiration for uh, saints in the age of electronic stained glass. And these are the anthropological types, to use one of Cornelius Castoriadis' terms from his book, The Imaginary Institution of Society, uh, that has come to replace the, the ancient saints and um, religious figures uh, as well, just as the imaginary significations have now been provided by brand names and logos. This is his great Marilyn diptych of 1962 from the same period. Now this plays around with the doubling of Marilyn, the fact that uh, she doubled her initials with the, the two M's, but also the fact that she had two names. Norma Jean Baker was her real name, Marilyn Monroe was her stage name, and she had two identities. And the key thing about the cult of the celebrity avatar is this descent into media whereby the media replicates the image, whether it's through television or through posters or uh, film or what have you, doesn't matter. It's the replication of the image that creates the two-dimensional avatar of the celebrity. And that can leach the physical three-dimensional live human being uh, of vitality in a way that causes psychological disorientation and destabilization. Gradually, Marilyn uh, succumbed to despair and depression and drugs over time. And I think that's sort of implied here by the fact that on the left, we have these technicolor images of her. And on the right, we've got these degraded images of her in black and white, which on one hand allude to the fact that she was in, she started off in black and white movies and then later did color movies. But it also plays with the fact that the great Marilyn avatar is the mediatized avatar, the two-dimensional avatar that has survived, uh, which led to the loss of the real Marilyn and her degradation into drugs and alcohol. Here is a, a later Marilyn that he did called Reversals from 1979 uh, and somewhere into the 80s. And here he plays around with almost every, all of um, Warhol's work can almost be regarded as a stark refutation of Walter Benjamin's idea that in the age of mass reproduction, the original work of art loses its aura. That may be true for the ancient works of art, uh, like say Leonardo's Mona Lisa, but it doesn't apply for the age of the celebrity in which the original, the actual three-dimensional physical uh, flesh and blood celebrity is less interesting than the mediatized two-dimensional replicated celebrity. And so here he casts Marilyn as though she were uh, a negative from a photograph. And again, in the age of mass reproduction, the photographic negative is much less interesting than the copies. It's the copies in the age of uh, post-historic society, of consumer, capitalist, uh, global civilization that matters and that interests anyone, not the originals or the, even the original person. Here we have his Red Elvis, uh, in which I think the Red, um, this is also from the same period, 1962, the Red almost suggests the comparison of the cult of Elvis with the cult of Dionysus, the god of wine, uh, which later becomes the blood of Christ uh, in the Christian mythos. But the Dionysus cults in the ancient world were the ancient world's equivalent to rock and roll, of course. They were cults of ecstasy, when, whereby people, especially women, went around going out of their minds playing music and tearing apart animals, blood and wine. Blood became a symbol for wine and all of that. And in many respects, I think uh, Elvis Presley represents a kind of resurgence or a recrudescence on the turn of the spiral of the cult of uh, Dionysus, the wine god. And perhaps the red in this painting alludes to that. Here is a, another Elvis painting that he did. This is Triple Elvis of 1963 that he rendered in silver. And uh, the silver had a number of associations for Warhol. One of them, he said, silver was, you know, it's what the astronauts wore in their spacesuits. It had a kind of space age connotation to it. It also referred to the silver screen. And I think here in this image of Elvis from one of his Westerns, Flaming Star, uh, this does refer to the silver screen. And it also refers to the silver that gets painted on the backing of a mirror. Uh, all of these Warhol points out in his, in his autobiography, but I think that the silver refers really to the comparison of the silver screen with the mirror. The mirror produces a double, a replicated image, just the same way as the silver screen replicates images and icons. And through that power of the silver screen to mirror back at us replications of gigantified humans, we begin to get uh, these multiplied doppelgangers and avatars that over time can cause a lot of psychological dissonance in the celebrity that can lead to a, an attempt to drown that dissonance in a flood of drugs and alcohol, which is exactly what happened with Elvis. And here is um, the last painting from Warhol that I want to show in this series. This is his Elvis 1 and 2 from 1964, which alludes back to his Maryland diptych, where we've got the Technicolor versus the black and white. 
And of course, Elvis II started out in a number of black and white movies and then uh, went over to color. But it also refers once again to the doubling process and, and phenomenon in which Elvis's avatar was created in his case, more so through the recording industry on the one hand and through television, uh, but also through films. Uh, in the case of James Dean and Marilyn Monroe, it was almost entirely through films, which created these undying avatars that are almost like the immortal gods, like the cults of Osiris and Dionysus, the dying and reviving gods that become legendary in memory. And these are the great uh, anthropological types of capitalist consumer society, these gigantic avatar humans that have come to replace uh, the ancient iconotypes of the crucifixion and the, the Mary cult and all of that that were the main iconotypes of the metaphysical age that were deconstructed as we have seen <clears throat> and became semiotic vacancies by the time of Mark Rothko as we have seen. So uh, Warhol can be regarded here I think in these early paintings as the first priest, the first sort of great um, icon painter of the cult of the dead celebrity. And next we'll look at some uh, some of his later paintings here.